Hi, I'm Koyal, and you're listening to the first episode of the Sci Art Edit podcast. In this podcast, I'll be exploring the what's, the hows, the whys, the who's, the everything of those exciting projects that bring the science and the arts together. In this episode, I've got two special guests with me, Marcus Bueller, a renowned material scientist from MIT who likes to get stuck into the mechanics of protein structures. We've also got Hyung Jun Won, South Korean violinist and musical director of Lindenbaum Festival Orchestra, who is interested in exploring the healing power of music. For a little context, in the spring of 2020, during the first wave of coronavirus infections, Marcus Bueller took it upon himself to create a musical piece based entirely on the structure of the coronavirus spike protein. This viral counterpoint, as it was called, went literally viral, ultimately reaching Hyung Jun, who at the time was all the way in South Korea playing music to hospitalized patients. Hyung Jun decided to reach out to Marcus after that, and this marked the beginning of a unique collaboration, which gave the world a sequel piece called Protein Antibody in E minor, composed by Marcus and performed by Hyung Jun and his orchestra. Now, when I first heard the two pieces, I was so curious, immediately drawn to learn more. And so fast forward, here we are. Here's their story. Hi, Marcus and Hyung Jin. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, Marcus, I'd like to start with you to perhaps take a look at your life before the collaboration. What are your scientific interests and what does your lab specifically research? Yeah, sure. So thanks for having me on your podcast. I'm very excited to be here today. Um, so what I'm, what I'm interested in in my, my work is to, to understand how materials are created, um, how they function, and how they fail. The one particular building block of materials that, I'm, that my lab studies are proteins, which are really the, the you know, most important building blocks or ingredients in all living things on Earth. And so while you've been working on the structure of proteins, how did music enter the scenario? What drew you to relate proteins to music in your work? You know, for many years, we've studied um, structure function relationships in, in different kinds of materials, including in proteins. And when you do that, you'll find that there are these what we call hierarchical structures. So basically organization of information or material in this case um, at different levels, you know, from the molecular level, supermolecular level, fibers, tissues, organisms, or even populations, if you think about an ecosystem. And 10, 15 years we worked on comparing um, the construction principles behind materials on one hand and then music on the other hand. And of course, this comes from my, my longstanding interest in music that I've had since I was a child. And um, sort of coming to, um, for, for many years, I couldn't really connect the two in my work. But you know, as our understanding of materials improved, um, we, we also applied math to the musical construction principles, and we could actually see um, some really interesting similarities and overlaps. And um, this sort of led from, you know, initial ideas and, you know, proof of concept into um, much more tangible activities in the lab and, um, you know, including a translation from um, material to music and also from music to material. Mm, so to compare and essentially translate music to material and material to music, um, I know this because I cheated and read a bit about your research before this interview, but I saw that you use AI models. So what prompted you to train and develop AI models um, to kind of compare the patterns between musical data and protein data? In in music, so so this is sort of how this came together. Um, AI is really good at detecting patterns, essentially. And I talked earlier about these hierarchical structures. And, you know, one of the things that's really hard, of course, is to develop a theory for musical creativity. Right? There, I mean, there are theories for part of it, maybe physical laws by which we create certain chords and chord progressions or, um, you know, um, tuning systems. But but beyond that, of course, there's the you know, human creativity that really makes up the, the, the creation of music. And um, that cannot be captured in the equations very easily. 
So what basically we've done, you know, in the last year is we, we try to bring these things together and say, okay, if we have a, you know, complicated system like a protein, yeah, that can be understood by AI. We have a complicated system like music. We can understand that using AI, you know, and we can actually connect them in, in interesting ways and solve problems of this translation. So in the original work that we published in 2019, um, we, we kind of said, okay, here we have um, data produced by, by nature proteins and we have data produced by humans which is the music the score essentially um, and we, we developed a technique to to connect them and in the the connection itself actually was based on physical principles of how these molecules in this case proteins how they vibrate right so matter at the nanoscale how they vibrate but then the way we used AI in that original paper was to say so what if you take maybe existing music, you train an AI model on, on existing human created music, and then you, you you say, well, let's you know generate a new piece of music. Um, what would that be like if it were a protein? Or uh, you know, can we just take a lot of proteins, make them into music, and then make new proteins from that by creating new music? Right. So those are the original ideas we explored, and um, and that led to you know series of you know, some compositions and some work we've done, and actually making it uh, you know audible and making it interesting but then you know later on this is sort of when we um i created this this whole method and then we uh, worked on lots of different proteins including some pathogens um uh, essentially viruses that you find in um in e coli the reason why we i translated these actually was because a lot of times these viruses are very small, obviously, and, and they are kind of um, a great model system. If you want to create music, um, kind of a symphony from a, um, you know, from, from a human, how a human is impossible. You don't even know how it looks like exactly. But, but if you take a single virus, it's much simpler. And so we can actually make this translation rigorous. And so here we can actually show that we can translate an entire um, virus into music and, you know, and listen to that. So I've done a lot of work on this um, you know, do, at, at that time. That's so fascinating. Um, and now that we're talking about viruses, actually, your your most popular musical piece, shall I say, till date, um, is actually that of the coronavirus spike protein. What made you want to work on the infamous coronavirus? Um, it, it was a this new disease that came came about, and very quickly scientists had um, actually identified the structure of one of the proteins in the virus, the spike protein. The structure was published. We knew the structure, the sequence, and you know, and I was so curious um, how it looked like, you know, and then I I looked at it and it looked absolutely fascinating. You know, it was much larger than anything I'd worked on before. Um, but it has a quite quite an quite an amazing, beautiful structure, and I was just drawn to this at the time, and so I said, you know, how would that sound like? And I remember I started working on it, um, you know, just sort of to explore this disease, which was scaring everybody in the world from a different perspective. And I thought, wow, maybe I can I can just see that virus from a different angle, right? And so this is what music can do. You can um, hear or see, understand things from a you know, from a very different perspective of how we how our brain can process information, not just by looking at it or reading a paper or looking at a graph, but, but actually using a totally different part of your brain to just um, infuse this information. So I guess this is a bit of a more technical question, but when you hear the piece, it goes through an interesting journey of sounds. I was wondering, how do those different notes and pitches compare to the actual structure of the protein? So in the, in the case of the protein, the virus, um, so each building block, the amino acid, has a um, um, sort of innate frequency, which um, gives us some idea of how what the pitch should be. And we can kind of order all the different amino acids we find in a, in a protein and say, you know, there's a the lowest frequency and then there's the highest frequency. And we can um, we can kind of spread them out on a, on a big piano, a few which on a score and say, and then we can kind of follow through um, which of the pitches are activated as the protein is created from the DNA. But then um, there are lots of other things going on. There's other structural levels. The protein isn't just is not just information 1D. It's actually a three-dimensional material object. So um, there's a local organization by which the amino acids fold. You know, we call it secondary structure. So you can imagine it's either it's like a um, maybe a helix, um, very organized, or it's organized in a crystal. It's random, and there's lots of different versions of this actually. And so each of these are going to create different um, manifestations by which these sounds are organized now in time and in volume. 
Okay, so now you're beginning to really see the musical aspect of that. So it's not just the sound, but it's it's organized in time and in in, in volume and dynamic aspects. But also, you know, different parts of the proteins are interwoven. It's kind of like a long chain that's uh, meets itself, folds on it onto itself many times, and they are touch points. And when the touch points occur. Um, you get resonances. You get essentially responses from one part of the protein to the other. And so musically, what that means is um, overlapping melodies. And so in terms of musical theory, um, you can capture this as counterpoint. You know, that's sort of the traditional way of looking at it. And so so this, what you hear in the piece really is this sort of reflection algorithmically of what the protein does and how it sounds like. We say, okay, so let's see, I want to hear all this information that's inputted by the protein. How do we really hear it. And so we choose instruments that can distinguish each other. So you can hear, okay, here's this information from that part of the protein. It's set in a harp instrument and here's maybe, you know, a trumpet playing another one and you can clearly hear the differences. And so that's how we, ch how I chose the instrument essentially is to make sure you can hear everything or most of it. And this is actually, I think the, for me, that's a lot of fun to do because you, you now have uh, this connection with the material and, you know, with, in this case, a virus. And you can really, um, uh, you know, begin to understand how we can communicate intellectually with this object, with this information that would not be possible otherwise. You know, we're not going to be able to talk. We're not going to be able to engage with the virus in, in such a deep way other than creating music, for example. Mm, it's, in, it's interesting. And another way I see it is that it's almost as if you've planted your own creative seed into the piece through your interpretation of which instruments to use. Your choice of instruments in a way kind of inform the musical output of the virus, which in turn influences how others perceive the viral proteins and broadly speaking, the disease. I was looking at the, the comments on the piece on SoundCloud and someone compared it to Bjork's music. She's a popular Icelandic singer who uses a lot of the mathematical structures of natural elements like crystals to inform her music. And I uh, I think it's very beautiful how in a similar way you, you've used this project to create something rooted in nature, in science, and yet reflective of your innate creativity as well. Um, so this piece, the viral counterpoint of the coronavirus spike routine, which you released in 2020, gained fame pretty quickly and raked in millions of listens. And Hyung Jin, who we also have the pleasure of having on this podcast, was first of the many musicians who actually reached out to you after the piece came out. Hyung Jin, would you like to join the discussion and just tell us a bit about how you learned about Marx's work and what made you reach out to him specifically? When coronavirus came to Korea, uh, we, we stopped everything. You know, people were dying and uh, the government and uh, everyone was in panic. And even including musicians, we had to stop playing and performing for ourselves and concerts, um, you know, they were canceled. Instead of just staying at home, I went to the hospital where the uh, coronavirus, uh, the patients were, um, you know, they were kind of cured in the room and they had to stay uh, for, you know, many weeks. But I went to the hospital and tried to, uh, you know, perform. And that was the time I encountered uh, the, the works of Mark Spuler because I saw the article, a scientist, you know, who translated uh, the, the coronavirus spike protein into music. And I, at that time, I was like, what is this? Because we human beings, we see objects by seeing through our eyes, not through our ears. And when I heard uh, the sound, you know, which was translated by Max Bueller, and it was really uh, fascinating. And it totally um, changed my mind because I thought uh, the sound from, you know, coronavirus would be uh, more dangerous and very uh, shocking sound, but instead it was beautiful. And that's how I um, decided to contact uh, with Marcus and, you know, get to know him more and, you know, get to know the music. And that's how we uh, started to uh, collaborate to each other. As you mentioned, Hyungjin, I, I see how it contradicts the metaphorical nature of the piece. It's, it's eerily calming.
So after he reached out to you, Marcus, you decided to work on a new piece for Hyunjun and his orchestra to perform called Protein Antibody in E Minor. Now, this piece you created is essentially based on the antibody protein that our bodies make to fight the virus. Can you tell us a little about that? This is actually, so yeah, Hugh Jun and I had lots of really interesting conversations by email and I think on Zoom sometimes, and we actually got to know each other quite well in the last couple of years. Um, but yeah, the, the piece that we first worked on, and, and actually first, I think I sent you a score of, I sent Hugh Jun a score of the, uh, the Balcano point, which was only an excerpt because he played it with um, his violin and he performed that, you know, a couple of times. But then we wanted to create something, um, together and this entire, Bio counterpoint pieces are way too complex for any orchestra to perform. Um, I mean, physically, even uh, let alone you know, from from performance perspective, and physically, meaning the, the the ranges of the notes and everything is not uh, probably not playable. But um, but anyway, so we worked together on a, on a new piece, and this new piece I, I I wrote that actually at the time. This was at the time when we had we had actually identified um, the first hopes for maybe treatments and vaccines, and people were developing uh, immunity because a lot of people had COVID. Um, and so there was this um, you know action now not of the spike protein only, but the spike protein with the antibody, which protects humans. So when you had COVID or had a vaccine, you know you'll be. Uh, protected because your body will produce antibodies, which essentially shut down the virus like protein by binding to it. And, and this, uh, binding process, I was sort of imagining, you know, back in the in March and April when I worked on the first piece, everybody was getting sick. And when I worked on the second piece, um, everyone had been sick and people were getting better and they had immunity. And so that was, um, um, the moment where we thought, you know, maybe the, the, the timely thing to do now could be a musical expression of that interaction between the antibody and the spike protein, which is what this piece is essentially. So it's a smaller part. Uh, it's not the entire protein. It's just the intersection between the two, which essentially for the for the audience, I mean, this is the the part of the um, the basically the, the 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 key part that makes you not get sick if your body is yeah. exposed, right? So the the antibody will kind of bind to that lock and key. Um, but it creates some really interesting resonances, right? Because now you have two proteins and they're, they're binding and all the things we've talked about earlier apply as well here. So the, the piece was, so I wrote the piece. Um, but of course that piece, I, um, you know, it, it was, um, it was simplified in some, in some instances, uh, to make it playable for an orchestra. And, and also I worked with Hyun Jun and his team to, to make it match the kind of instruments they had, the number of players they had, performers they had, and so on. Um, even with that, it's very difficult still. You know, <laughs> you can you know, always have ongoing discussions on this, but, but it is much, um, you know, simpler structure. And musically, it, um, you know, it resembles the same architecture as the other piece, but it's, it's shorter. I finished that. Um, and then I sent a score to Hyun Jun. He performed that and practiced it. And then we iterated a couple of times and created a final score. And I mean, I let him talk a little bit about that experience now. Hyun Jun, um, I'm also curious to know how coming from a completely musical background and not knowing anything about much of the science behind the antibody, um, what your initial thoughts were of the score and the abstract nature of the piece. Well, as I said, I mean, I thought I expected the virus music, viral uh, music, uh, you know, sounds more like shocking and uh, eccentric and maybe, you know, more complicated and more deadly complex, but that totally changed my mind that actually when I played, when I saw the music from Mark Spuler, and it was not, I mean, still the viral music is beautiful. And and I think Max, uh, he mentioned, maybe it sounds like uh, they manipulate or they kind of trick the human cells before they're, you know, they enter our body because they have to enter our body to survive. I'm not gonna lie, when I when I first heard the protein antibody in E minor piece, I thought that it actually sounded sinister and more frightening than the viral counterpoint one, despite it being based on an antibody, which is essentially helping to protect you, right, against the virus. Um, I would have thought that the antibody piece would actually sound hopeful and positive as the body heals from the infection. But um, but yeah, actually the viral counterpoint 
piece was the more peaceful of the two, I found at least. Um, it's almost like an irony. Can I can I say something about that? I think it's it actually really interesting to hear both of you comment on this. Now, for me, this you know it emerges from the through the the compositional process that we described, um, and 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 there's no objective sort of in the creation of this music that says that one has to be more sinister or not. I mean, it's it's just sort of what happens, and and it's very interesting the effect. But but one observation I I have actually is. The you know the 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 spike protein as Hugh said it, it it tricks our bodies and it sort of is you know like a is a friendly visitor knocking on the door pretending to be all nice and <laughs> gentle, but actually has a, a you know very very uh, sinister objective. So what you hear is really this knocking on the door, and so you you hear of course pleasant things. But in the other piece, you hear that fight, you hear that fighting and the conflict and the um, kind of that that. Maybe that playful attempt of the virus spike to uh, to attack the cell, but then the antibody fighting back, and then you get this really interesting dynamic, which which is like you said, Hugh Jin. I mean, the the piece is much more dynamically variant uh-huh. than the original one. That fight that's going on is maybe what makes it more sinister. I mean, I've never thought about it like until you both mentioned this today, but. Um, that could be an interesting interpretation, actually. It's so funny because I thought of that because it's antibodies. It should be more happy, and it should be more uh, cured. So I thought of that's maybe more beautiful. But when you see the music, uh, it's 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 more complex and it's very hard to play. And sometimes the rhythms are very complicated. Yeah, it's it's interesting how one piece can have such a bipolarizing effect for for different people. Much much like how art is um, perceived really by by the world. You know, you might like something that I'm not a fan of, and vice versa. So, um, I was hoping to also ask just before you need to dash off whether you have any upcoming projects influenced by this collaboration. Um, maybe translating a new virus or something that takes you in a completely different direction to the one you envisioned before this collaboration. You know, that, that's definitely an aspect that um, we, you know, we've discussed and, and also something that we're exploring on you know, a scientific level is um, the, the principle essentially of taking um, um, resonances in, a, in, a, in an object, right. which is what you hear in the, you know, the music, if we can um, use these to essentially destroy the virus. Um, and I think that's an interesting avenue it's a very long road to get there because it's very complex. But and and why resonances in particular? So so the idea is essentially to not have to use chemical um, subjects like like an antibody or a vaccine, but say, hey, if I can physically destroy a virus with high specificity, so if if every pathogen and this isn't just applied to viruses, could apply to anything, um, if you can destroy an object in your body without chemicals. And that's really the thing that the key selling point is we don't want to put drugs in our bodies that you know make us even more sick, have side effects. Um, but but perhaps there's a way there. And and so that's one thing that the music taught us actually is that we have this understanding of the frequencies and vibrations. Can we use this now to to actually um, make the this piece of material and stable. That's that's an area I think that's very exciting. Um, and so here's sort of how you know music can inform, art can inform, scientific discovery as well, and, and can can have you think outside the box. And that's really the key. But yeah, art can play that role as well for me personally. I, I think you get inspiration about scientific questions and ideas you can explore. Uh, this work, I mean, is really great. And, and I've learned you know actually a lot from Kim Jin because he keeps challenging me um, that direction of the work and we've had some really great discussions on this and we, we started a small project um and trying to implement some of those some of those things as well so we'll we'll see what happens with that scientists and musicians we can collaborate together to find out the solution that's what i believe well i'm more than positive that this is the first of many collaborations and you've showcased so elegantly through these compositions how material science can be explored and interpreted through music in an engaging and innovative way. Thank you so, so much, Young Jin and Marcus, for joining us today in the podcast. It's been a pleasure chatting to you about the two pieces you made and the whole ideation and science behind it. And finally, a massive thanks to any listeners out there. 
I've popped in a link to both the pieces we discussed in the description. And if you liked what you heard in this episode, follow us. I I say us, it's, it's really me. And share this episode with some friends out there. They, they might like it too. I'm Coyle, and this is the Sciot Edit. Have a lovely week, everyone. And thank you again, Marcus and Hyunjun, for joining us for the very first episode. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.